Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, pass on uh, Tom Madden's uh, regrets for not being able to participate in today's conference, but nevertheless, we're very excited to have the opportunity to share with you some of the very exciting work that's currently ongoing at Acuitas. For those of you who don't know or aren't familiar with Acuitas, we're a biotech company located here in Vancouver focused on the development, not surprisingly, I'm sure, of lipid nanoparticles for the delivery of nucleic acid therapeutics. And within that context, we have the opportunity to work with a broad range of partners and collaborators to advance new therapeutics, largely at this point, mRNA therapeutics, to meet unmet clinical and medical needs. So for those of you familiar with mRNA and their potential applications in uh, medicine, I guess it's no surprise that the, it cuts a pretty broad swath um, and has been uh, proposed and we have worked on a, quite a wide variety of different applications. Um, and today specifically, I'll be uh, talking about what is the most advanced uh, therapeutic area, which of course is vaccine. Um, specifically to express viral or bacterial proteins, thereby inducing adaptive uh, humoral and cellular immune responses. Now, as all of you know, there's, in terms of traditional vaccine development, there are uh, a significant number of different approaches, and these include things such as live uh, immunization with live and attenuated viruses, recombinant proteins, synthetic peptides, and while they've all proven to be, or many of them have proven to be effective, uh, the one constant among them is that they involve very time, labor, and cost-intensive processes. And in comparison, I think uh, nucleic acid-based vaccines offer several potential advantages, and several of which are, I think are pretty resonant now in, in the world that we're currently living, uh, specifically a reduced development time and reduced development cost. Um, and, uh, of course, the one nuance that we can all appreciate here is that nucleic acid vaccines, nucleic acid drugs generally, but certainly vaccines, require a delivery system to achieve intracellular delivery. And while some of us or some people might argue that it's already been 30 years, almost 30 years since that initial proof of concept report, in 1993 of a mRNA, or sorry, a DNA vaccine with still no nucleic acid-based vaccine approved for use in humans, I would suggest to you or argue to, with you, um, and certainly uh, as echoing a number of things said in earlier talks, that recent developments very strongly suggest that we are approaching the first, uh, uh, first approved nucleic acid vaccine. And so over the next few slides, I'm going to share with you um, some of the background work that has that basically has brought us to where we are today. Um, and a lot of this is uh, is work done with uh, our collaborators and with our partners, all aimed at uh, developing therapeutic vaccines. But as you can expect, that we have learned very much from these studies and. Uh, and hopefully it will provide you with some of the basis for our optimism in regards to mRNA vaccines, mRNA LNP vaccines. So this is uh, this slide shows some work that was done in collaboration with uh, our uh, group at the University of Pennsylvania under Drew Weissman, and uh, who has a significant interest in the development of influenza vaccines. The data shown here was published in 2018 basically showing that a single intramuscular immunization with 30 micrograms of mRNA encoding the influenza hemagglutinin protein was able to induce very robust adaptive immune responses. And these are characterized very importantly uh, on the left two panels, uh, basically high uh, antibody titers against the hemagglutinin protein, which is typically one of the immunodominant uh, proteins in anti-influenza immunity. And uh, what you can see during the analysis of the humor responses at 14 and 28 days is uh, a very high level of uh, 
hemagglutinin binding immunoglobulin. And what's particularly, certainly very high levels compared to say a non, uh, some control RNA, the loop RNA shown there. But uh, what's surprisingly obvious here and, and worth noting is that the mRNA LMP vaccine induced uh, much superior uh, antibody titers compared to uh, influenza vaccine shown as the uh, inactivated virus and maybe even more surprisingly, a more robust immunoglobulin response compared to even infection with a live virus, which is typically considered the gold standard in regards to inducing adaptive humoral immune responses. So, um, you know, certainly underlining the robust immune response, humoral immune response, and that humoral immune response is supported, as shown in the right-hand panel, by the induction of antigen-specific multifunctional T cells. In this case, shown CD4 T cells, but a very similar situation if you were to look at CD8 T cells. And what does uh, the this induction of uh, this level of immunity mean? Well, first of all, the one thing that I should point out is that the humoral immune response is extremely durable in, in this uh, model. Uh, the left-hand panel basically shows antibody titers tracked out for greater than a year, and it's remained surprisingly constant over that period of time. And that a level of immunity is able to protect the animals against what would otherwise be a lethal viral challenge shown on the right-hand side. Uh, animals that had been immunized were protected both from weight loss shown in the black circles in the middle panel and uh, was able and all of the animals uh, survived the viral challenge and this is compared to animals immunized with a control LMP, uh, mRNA LMP containing loop mRNA where they showed significant weight loss and complete mortality within 15 days. And so uh, part of the work that uh, went into investigating this uh, was able to document probably one of the uh, underlying uh, uh, properties of mRNA LMPs, is, which is the ability to induce uh, immune responses, which are very supportive of these robust and long-lived humoral responses specifically uh, shown uh, there is induction of CD4 positive T follicular helper cells. And uh, those T follicular helper cells have been shown to be vital for the uh, induction of germinal center B cells shown in the next panel, and ultimately leading to high levels of plasma B uh, lymphocytes, which ultimately, as you know, are responsible for uh, production and uh, maintenance of circulating immunoglobulins. And so, um, you know, and that's just a, like basically the tip of the iceberg for a lot of the uh, proof of principle, proof of concept, as well as uh, vaccine uh, development studies that we've undertaken with our collaborators. And, um, you know, armed with that kind of information, I, it seems like a long time ago, but if we can cast our minds back to 2015, 2016, the virus outbreak of concern then was the Zika virus, um, which was not a newly emergent virus at that point. It had actually been documented for quite a while, but certainly was particularly uh, of concern at that point with almost 200,000 confirmed cases in that uh, two year period and with greater than half a million suspected cases. And uh, in 2017, we published in Nature, with again, Drew Weissman's group, uh, the ability to induce anti-Zika, productive anti-Zika uh, immunological protection using an mRNA LMP vaccine. Shown here is the data from uh, the uh, primate data where uh, immunization with a single dose of either 50, 200, or 600 micrograms of mRNA encoding the pre-membrane envelope fusion protein was able to induce in the left-hand panel high levels of immunoglobulin that could bind, recognize and bind the envelope protein. And those uh, antibodies were able to mediate uh, um, virus neutralization shown in a couple of different assays on the right-hand side. 
ultimately what did that mean? Well, that when we went ahead and challenged those uh, NHPs, the macaques, with Zika, what we were able to show is that immunization with as little as 50 micrograms of mRNA, a single 50 microgram dose was able to completely protect the uh, macaques from a Zika challenge uh, five weeks after immunization. And the graph here simply shows uh, the prevalence of viral RNA in control animals shown in black versus uh, immunized animals shown in orange, red, or purple. So um, again, that's uh, very much the tip of the iceberg in, in much of the work that we've done um, developing mRNA LMP vaccines. Um, and it basically leads us to where we are today in regards to some of the work that we're doing uh, developing a COVID, SARS COVID 2 vaccine. I don't think I really need to go into anything here. I think it certainly has been top of mind over the last little while. Um, but uh, certainly, this the screenshot is simply from the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus, Coronavirus Resource Center um, as recently as last night. And obviously, you can see there uh, up to 30 million, almost 30 million global cases with almost 1 million. Uh, global deaths around the world. So obviously a very significant uh, threat um, to our world as, as we currently see it. And so um, using uh, the work uh, and the background that we've developed with our collaborators, uh, we uh, entered into significant preclinical and clinical studies on developing uh, COVID uh, mRNA LNT vaccine. This is work again with Weissman's uh, group at UPenn, where single immunization with 30 micrograms of mRNA expressing either the re receptor binding domain of the COVID spike protein or, or alternatively a pre-fusion pre stabilized spike protein mRNA was able to induce high le levels of uh, S spike protein specific IgGs in the plasma. And again, that uh, level of uh, IgG was able to mediate uh, virus neutralization shown in the right-hand panel. Uh, consistent with the work that I showed in the influenza, the high levels of uh, circulating immunoglobulin was supported by induction, very robust induction of CD8 and CD4 T cells that was found um, predominantly uh, within tissues, in this case, spleen and lung, um, and, uh, and shown on the right-hand side, is, it shows that these uh, um, cellular uh, T cell responses uh, were activated as shown by the expression of the CD69 activation uh, marker and that all of the activated cells were largely uh, tissue in, uh, infiltrating. The other aspect, which is also very important in regards to uh, a robust and maintaining a robust and, and durable immune response is the fact that they, they are Th1 biased. And similar, in a very similar uh, approach, we also have collaborated with a group at Imperial College London under the direction of uh, Robin Shattuck, um, developing a very similar approach, but rather than mRNA, uh, they use the self-amplifying RNA, which potentially will allow the use of a uh, potentially lower dose of uh, RNA. And we can sh uh, see in the left-hand panel uh, spike protein, induction of spike protein specific IgGs, which are able to neutralize in the middle panel and as well supported by uh, cellular immune responses. The, the, this response is uh, dose dependent uh, and uh, the doses ranging, effective doses, you know, starting as low as 0.1 microgram of mRNA uh, given uh, as two uh, intramuscular injections. So all of the work, uh, preclinical work using our, our mRNA LMPs has been extremely promising. And, uh, and that of course has led, uh, as you might expect, 
in view of the dire need uh, into the clinic. And ac currently, Acuitas is, uh, the, and our LMP technology is uh, contributing to three human vaccine trials for SARS-CoV-2. Two of the trials are currently in phase one, two, uh, with one trial uh, currently in a pivotal phase two, three study. Uh, and the last few slides, I'll just simply be showing uh, some of the supporting phase one, two studies, data from the one, two studies that supported and drove into the phase uh, three study. Um, Ying, just, just a, a gentle reminder of a few minutes. Yeah. And so just uh, in the, uh, and just as a general comment, there were uh, four, there were the phase one, two studies that uh, evaluated safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity of four different mRNA LMPs. Uh, so there were two IM injections, 10, 30, and 100. This is the uh, neutralizing titers uh, induced after single, uh, shown a single or the prime or the boot and the prime end boost in immunization for the different doses. And we found that uh, we had neutralizing titers approximating three times level compared to what we would see in patients that are recovered from COVID. Uh, overall, the tolerability and safety is consistent with pre previous observations. They were dose dependent and increased uh, following boost and symptoms were transient and typically resolved within days of immunization. There was a second uh, phase one, two study with the same LMP just to give a more detailed immune analysis. And we can say that the results were consistent with the first trial. The main finding from this was that the immunoglobulins were able to broadly neutralize a wide range of spike variants and that there was a robust CD4 and CD8 T cell response that was TH1 biased. So where we are now is that the pivotal SARS-CoV-2 phase three study with our LMPs, um, basically the specific LMP that was selected and encapsulated an mRNA encoding a full length stabilized spike protein rather than the trimer that was used in the data I showed you. The immuno immuno immunology readouts were similar but showed reduced reactogenicity. The pivotal trials were enrolled 30 to 44,000 subjects. It was initiated in July, uh, in July and enrollment I think is scheduled to be completed on the first 30,000 by this week or next week. And the phase three data is expected to be reported by October. And this is the slide that acknowledges the contributions from uh, all, all the groups that uh, provided the data. Thank you. Thank you very much at work. I've got a couple of questions from the attendees. Uh, one says, how does your mRNA LMP vaccine address the numerous genetic mutation of SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, as I indicated in the slide, sorry, I was going kind of quickly. Um, during the clinical study, what they did was they took the, they uh, made an, a series of pseudotype viruses which showed a, a variety of mut uh, mutated uh, spike proteins, and they found that the antibody was able to neutralize the, the whole range of mutated spike proteins. So the expectation is that there will be little, if any, viral escape due to mutation that way. Okay. We have also a question from Roy van der Meel from the Netherlands. Hi, Ying. Great talk. Beautiful work. In addition to mRNA's immunostimulatory effect, can you elaborate on the adjuvants that can be incorporated in LMP systems to improve the immune response? Yeah, that's a great question, but not a simple question to answer. I think that um, the induction of productive humoral immune responses is probably not as simple as saying that if it was more immunostimulatory, it would be better. There's, uh, we have data in a lot of our publications to indicate that um, undesired immune responses, particularly pro-inflammatory, actually tend to uh, divert the immune response away from the productive uh, uh, neutralizing antibody responses. So um, almost all of the, almost but not all of the mRNA LMP vaccines currently in clinical trials are actually designed to be uh, relatively immune silent in regards to induction of uh, inflammatory response. 
Thank you. And I have a last question. In your full length encoding mRNA constructs of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, do you include the transmembrane regions of the protein? Could you please justify the inclusion or, ex or exclusion of this region? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to have to admit that we were not involved in the design of that protein, of that particular construct. Um, but one thing I would say is uh, you are able to include those in uh, mRNA encoded antigen. Now, whether or not it provides an advantage or not, I, I don't really know. But uh, what I would say, and I mentioned briefly, is that you know, the mRNA LMP vaccine that included purely the R, uh, RBD was as, as effective immunologically as the one that encoded to stabilize the full length protein. What that tells us, I'm not exactly sure, and, and it probably will be uh, take some time to dissect the specific immune responses. Oh, we have one more question. This is going to be the last one. Uh, which strategy preparation of lipid nanoparticles is more useful with the mRNA from IgG levels, LMP or lipoplex like BioNet? You know, I'm going to have to admit, we, we ourselves have never done the comparison. We do work with partners that have, uh, that have used lipoplexes in the past. Um, and I would say overall that the uh, responses to the lipid nanoparticle seem to be more profound. Um, you know, the exact, the exact genesis of that, whether or not it's a negative effect of the polyplex and the charges on the polyplex, the size. Uh, we haven't done a detailed analysis of that, but